In our second text, we meet Jacob standing on the edge of the promised land, having been exiled on the run from his murderous brother for 20 years. God has called him back, and he knows that across the river, Esau waits with an army of 400 men. Here again, the word of the Lord proclaimed in Genesis 32, verses 22 through 31. The same night he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his eleven children and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and likewise everything that he had. Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. And the man said, let me go, for day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. This too is the word of the Lord. Join me in prayer. God of mercy, you promised to never break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, speak your eternal word that does not change, that we may respond to your gracious promise with faithful and obedient lives. Amen. The thing that you have to remember about Jacob is that if he had gotten killed by his brother's 400 men, he would have dang well deserved it. He had once stolen his twin's birthright. Oafish, hairy Esau came in from a hunt, and Jacob withheld his supper, some of that red, red stuff, Esau called it, till he got the land. Jacob whose name predicted a life of tomfoolery, the trickster, the supplanter, the heel, took everything Esau was promised in exchange for a cup of soup. And then Jacob turned around and took his father's blessing. Old, blind Isaac, lying on his deathbed, doubted the voice of the one who called himself Esau, but the hands felt Right, so he asked once more for confirmation. Who are you, my son? What is your name? This was Jacob's moment. He had wrestled with his brother in the womb, had kicked and grabbed even as he was born. He had wanted to be first. And when he wasn't, he was going to go after whatever consolation he could get. Who are you, my son? His father asked. The answer slid out so easily that the heel almost forgot he was lying. I am Esau. Well, Jacob got the blessing, and with it he got exile, because Esau, oafish, a little dumb, simple maybe, though he might be, Esau was going to kill him. The Old Testament, I think, often feels so far away from us, so removed from our modern lives. Its kings are ruthless and deviant. Its heroes are melodramatic, and they're often amoral. At the worst of times, we suppose that its God is somehow other or different than the God revealed to us in Jesus. Jacob, though, Jacob, I think, he crosses that divide. He, like so many of us, had a good life, albeit one spent wrestling, wagering with and against himself, with and against his God, with and against the world. 
Jacob embodies our present moment. Struggle to define ourselves, to mold our identity, to distinguish and make a name for ourselves. He is, I think, the man for 21st century American Christianity. But of course, I'm getting my head ahead of myself. Let's fast forward a few minutes. Go back to the story. 20 years. 20 years have passed in exile, and Jacob has amassed for himself a fortune. So too has Esau. Things were going along nicely for both until God called Jacob back. He would have to face Esau. From whom? By answering that one simple question. He had stolen everything. Aware that Esau and his men might kill him, he sent tribute across the Jabbok in waves everything he had, and then he set up camp. But still, brazen, bombastic Jacob couldn't sleep. So he sent his family across the river too, hoping that he could at least preserve their lives. Now he was alone in the dead of night, separated from everything. Between fits of sleep and wake, he peered over the river into the promised land toward the birthright wrenched from his brother, the blessing stolen from his father, Esau's awaiting troops. And then he was hit. In the dead of night, a man appeared. Jacob could not see his face, but he was full of power. It was a dull long match. Was this Esau, he wondered, come ahead of his men, one of his troops, disgruntled Laban, his father-in-law, Jacob, felt his confidence ebb. He would die here, staring across the river into the promised land. Hours in, and they were deadlocked, flesh against flesh, thudding and dull. The midnight darkness melted into a hollow blackness. The fight, it seemed, would never end. And then finally, the sun streaked across the horizon, and with it, a sudden surge of strength from the man he reached toward Jacob's side, and with surgical precision, wrenched his hip socket. Searing pain, but Jacob held. And the man, but now that Jacob heard him, this was not Esau, nor even Laban, perhaps not even a man. The being spoke. Let me go, for day is breaking. Now we're talking, thought the old trickster. If he couldn't couldn't win in a fight, he could win a deal. He had won the birthright, he had won his father's blessing, and now he would demand another, certainly a greater blessing from this greater being that leaked divinity, this being who faintly, impossibly reminded him of God. That is what a blessing was for, he reasoned, to ensure life, to ensure prosperity, to comfort in the face of an assailant, whether it be across the river tomorrow or here on its banks. I will not go, says the trickster, until you bless me. In response, his opponent, and now Jacob knew for certain that this was no ordinary man, his opponent asked him a question, one he had heard many long years ago, one that got him into all this mess to begin with. What is your name? And just like that, after hours of wrestling, After a catastrophic injury, Jacob is undone. He took his time, at least I like to think so. He ran through all the possibilities, who he would be this time, what the consequences of that identity might produce, the trickster his name meant, the holder of the heel, the supplanter, he who acts crookedly, who now has an injury that renders him crooked. After a pause that may as well have lasted 20 years, Jacob finally, finally says his own name. Yes, Jacob is precisely the man for the 21st 
century. Like so many of us, he has, through hard work and cunning and accidents of birth, come upon much, not the least of which is a faithfulness to the God of Abraham. Jacob has every reason to believe that God is firmly on his side. But if that's true, he wonders, what in the world is he wrestling for? Who are you, my son? What is your name? The question should sound familiar. It echoes across continents and centuries. We can manage our brand so easily now. We can construct our image and our identity all at the click of a button. We verify our identity every time we visit a new website. In the 21st century, we can, we're told, become anything we want to be, shape and mold and make our own image. Thus says the gospel of American prosperity, if God is on your side, there is no stopping you. Unless, that is, right in the middle of your best laid plans and, screams, and schemes, right in the middle of untagging yourself from a particularly unfortunate picture, unless God, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, unless God stops you, Jacob wrestled his unknown assailant and feared for his life. He had believed truly and simply that if God was with him, he would prosper forever and ever and ever. Amen. But when his prophets started to dwindle, when his self-sure, cocky facade started to crumble, when his carefully constructed identity began to slip away from him, when Jacob found himself wrestling for his life. He wondered at God's absence, deadlocked with the divine, separated from all of the things around which he had built his identity, his brand. Jacob feared that he had never been blessed at all or that he was being punished for his bounty. He feared that fate had finally caught up with him. It took the wrenching of his hip and a haunting question to recognize God as the one who had disrupted him that a bum hip and the feeling of having just barely survived was precisely his blessing. The story doesn't end there, of course. God doesn't just wrestle for the fun of it, some sort of divine wrestlemania. Though it was Jacob who wrestled, Jacob who had set up camp at the Jabbok, Jacob who angled for a blessing who tried his advantage. It was not Jacob who walked away. Having engaged in divine fisticuffs, God now gives Jacob a new identity, Israel. He who struggles with God and men, it means. God perseveres, a name in the perpetual present tense, a promise, a reality. Jacob to Israel. God finally gives the blessing in full, and though it is recorded off mic, we can be certain that it is rooted in a bum hip and a new name. For Jacob, God had become the divine comforter, a means by which he justified his status quo, buoyed up his fortune, a box to check as he surveyed his plenty. Jacob had assumed that the role of the deity was security, to maintain all as it was, to keep his stock trading ever upward. Israel, however, found in God a different sort of sparring partner. Israel's, and by extension ours, is a God rooted in perpetual engagement, a God who refuses to let go until the other is made new, who pushes and prods and challenges, who wounds and blesses. Neither an abstract transcendent deity nor a divine teddy bear who always reflects and mirrors our likes and dislikes, our politics and prejudices. No, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Jesus Christ is a divine other who miraculously 
impossibly, startlingly comes to us to form and mold us, a divine incarnation by which we are made more fully human. Here we are in the fast-paced, dazzling, confounding 21st century. We are seeking security in our self-created identities and so often confusing God with our own subjective prejudices and delicate positions. We suppose that God loves exactly what we love, distrusts whatever or whomever we distrust. We allow ourselves to believe that we are not the ones in need of correction, that we have a corner on the will of God for the world. But in so doing, we have confused God's unfailing faithfulness, God's unwavering love for a justification of our own brokenness. We have begun to make God in our image rather than allowing ourselves to be made in God's. For far too long, we have told ourselves that God's faithfulness towards us means that we are guaranteed comfort as a portion for our faith, security in all matters, wealth in the world, dominance in society, assurance and morality. But Israel is formed from a divine smackdown. God will not be domesticated. God is present. God is indeed always for us, even as he wrestles. God is indeed for Jacob. That is precisely why he walks away with a limp. Jacob reminds 21st century American Christians, Christians like us, of this. Being chosen is a broken path. It is a comfort, yes, of course, always, because God is truly God for us and with us, just as God is for and with the world. But it is a struggle, a struggle to release control, to embrace vulnerability, to be made new to be Jacob, to be a person of faith in the 21st century, to be a Christian means opening yourself up to the God who wrestles, getting comfortable with growing pains, with a wrench in your side, with a wound that is also a blessing, a wound into which God pours a new name and a new identity and makes for you a new life. To be a Christian is not a swagger. It is a limp. Having left the place, a place he names after the God with whom he wrestled, Jacob limps to meet Esau, who in front of 400 men, runs to Jacob become Israel, embraces him, falls on his neck and kisses him, weeps. Jacob, who saw God in the dark opponent, sees him again the second time in a day. God in oafish, slow, hairy Esau's loving face. But he would have never seen it were it not for the limp, the humility, the transformation by which in his entire world was named, made new. Yes, Jacob become Israel is precisely the man for the 21st century. His is a messy life, a privileged life that nonetheless reflects a profound struggle, a struggle for identity and place, a struggle to keep faith with the willful, wily challenge of a living God. Jacob gets his blessing and challenges us with it. To be blessed, to be formed by God is not a matter of stuff. It's being made, no, wrestled into that which we were created to be. It's being given an identity rooted in God's faithfulness, not our own good fortune or hard work. God is mysteriously, powerfully present, not only in the good, but in frustration, in chaos, in fear, in moments that teach us who we might become and the radical identity of the one whom we worship. 
The blessing is in the limp, and praise God for it, in a man walking away from a divine smackdown, a defeat that is nonetheless also a radical victory. Here at Peniel, here in the arms of the brother, here limping into the promised land, here Jacob is blessed. Don't be surprised when you wrestle with God, when you truly engage with the object of your faith. If you walk away with a limp, don't be surprised at the new person you've become, the new identity you've been given. Israel, God perseveres. It's a name for us all to live into, a promise for all of our future wrestlings. The sun rises after the evening. In the desert, a path appears. Feel its warmth and its promise. Lean into your limp and answer its question. Who are you?